From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. At war with ISIS, the attacks in Paris have thrust security threats back to the top of the global agenda. Is it time for boots on the ground in Syria, diplomacy, or a mix of both? Plus, the civil war in Syria has led to a refugee crisis and raised security concerns here in the U.S. This week on Newsmakers, United States Senator Jack Reed. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Good morning, everyone. And, Senator, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to point out to our viewers that we are taping this program on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It's obviously a very volatile time, so a lot can happen. I want to point out that timing. One day before the terrorist attack in France, the president said the Islamic State is, quote, contained. Do you agree or disagree? The Islamic State still poses a huge challenge to not just the United States but the world community. And it's a multi-dimensional challenge. One is their territorial expansion, uh, Iraq and Syria. And to a degree, we've checked their expansion. In fact, we've had operations in uh, Sinjar in Iraq with Kurdish force on the ground, American air power, pushed them back, cut a key line of communication between Mosul and their Raqqa in Syria. Also in Syria, with, with Kurdish uh, forces, we've been able to push back on Kobani. So the issue of sort of the territorial expansion has been restrained and we're pushing back slightly. But the other dimension, which is uh, alarming, is their ability to project uh, terror activities across the globe. That's the Paris attack. And then a few days later, in sort of a, by an al-Qaeda element, unrelated, but another attack in Mali. So that effort is very much disconcerting as to what they're doing. And the final issue, is sometimes overlooked, is this information campaign they're waging. Very sophisticated uh, on the social media, the internet, Twitter, attracting people, intimidating individual governments and per persons in the, in the region. So we have a, uh, we have a major effort on the way to, to, to stop them and then degrade them and ultimately destroy them. So this is a very, very difficult situation. So it sounds like you disagree, though, with that statement. Well, I, I think if you look just on a narrow focus, which perhaps the president was taken, of the territorial expansion of uh, ISIS, that has been checked. I, I can recall you know, a year ago when there was real concerns that they would roll into Baghdad after they took Mosul. That has pretty much been checked because of our efforts in Iraq. Uh, in fact, uh, Iranian forces are in there too. They're fighting them because of the differences between the, the Shia Iranians and the Sunni ISIL forces. So we're in the sectarian battle. This is a very complex battle. So in the territorial sense, you could make the, the uh, judgment perhaps that, that we're beginning to slowly, gradually uh, get back ground. But this other dimension um, is one that you know we have to adjust to and, and find. I don't think we can take any sort of satisfaction that we, you know, that you know they're um, obsolete. They're going away. You know, they are a current and persistent danger. You're one of the most influential Democrats at this point on military affairs down in Washington. Has the president followed the course you've generally advised to him privately, or has he not listened to what, you, what you've suggested over the last couple of years in Syria? No, I think uh, the president generally has uh, adjusted to this very dynamic situation. And one of the things that ISIL has demonstrated is, is great adaptability. They're not al-Qaeda. They, they are al-Qaeda 2.0 or 3.0 because they've learned. Al-Baqadi, who is their, uh, their caliph, self-proclaimed, you know, spent years in U.S. detention and he learned. Uh, many of his key lieutenants were actually in Saddam Hussein's army in, in Iraq and they are professionals, intelligence, military professionals with ties back to the Syrian government in some cases. So you've got a very, very difficult and challenging opponent. And the, the approach that has been taken is first, you know, st stabilize the situation in Iraq and then start with air power and try to develop indigenous boots on the ground to begin to take back territory and then begin also, as I said, to uh, preempt these attacks that are aimed at Europe or the homeland, and then finally this information campaign. So I, I think, you know, we, the outline of the strategy is sound. What I think we have to do is we have to accelerate our efforts, frankly. Uh, one thing that's been done is that we've tried to unify the command. 
uh, Lieutenant General Sean McFarland is now sort of operational commander in both Iraq and Syria, the, the counter ISIS fight. And that just took place a few months ago. So those types of command and control uh, improvements will help. People are going to hear this and say, go. Jack Reed says the president has the right strategy and it's you know, it's on track, largely. Is that is that the right way to characterize it? No, I think it? the way we characterize it is, he, uh, I think the, uh, he, he understands, and it's not, you know, his understanding alone, that the, the best formula to ultimately defeat ISIS is to provide the critical support the United States can give, air power, intelligence, logistics, training. But on the ground, we've got to get people in there who are the locals who will fight f and not only fight for the territory but hold the territory because so, they see they own it. The other factor too which he has done and I think again one of the, the, the points you could make is that it's it, some of these things could have done f been faster, sooner, uh, more aggressively. I think that message has you know, gotten through. For example, the president has uh, indicated 50 at least special forces operators will be going into Syria to help uh, coordinate uh, fires to help train, uh, to help these forces on the ground. Uh, so we have to do more. So uh, special no forces aside. No one should be satisfied by the line, uh, until these folks are really defeated. And have you been frustrated at all with President Obama? I think the frustra I think we're frustrated uh, it, not just uh, with you know, individuals, but frustrated with the extraordinarily complex situation. I think when you get into this, the dynamic between the Sunnis and Shia, the dynamic between the Gulf states, the Saudis, for example, who, you know, there are individual Saudis who have been for years funneling money to some of these radical uh, jihadist elements. That has to stop. The, the ability to, to coordinate with uh, you know, and find a moderate Syrian opposition, because ultimately these military activities are critical, but Ultimately, it'll be some type of political settlement. That's the, that's what we're we're trying to lead to. So it is frustrating, but it's a situation that, frankly, invites because of its complexity and because of the the nature of our opponents, ruthless, homicidal, you know, inhuman uh, fighters. Th this is a very difficult situation. Special forces aside, you have said indigenous boots on the right. ground. There have been some calls to get U.S. troops in there. Right. I believe Senator John McCain is talking right. about uh, an injection of U.S. military. Mm -hmm. Should we? Well, I, I, I think that uh, the best approach, as I've said, uh, is to have local forces. Uh, just, I think, a few days ago, General David Petraeus, who knows uh, a lot about uh, combating these types of elements indicated that American boots on the ground, in the terms of combat brigades, formal American units going in, conventional units, would not be the answer. Uh, and I tend to agree with them. I think we can do more and should do more with our special operations forces. We could be more aggressive on our rules of engagement in terms of what they can do and what they can't do. Uh, but I think you know, putting forces in the ground is not going to be the, uh, uh, I'm again, I'm talking about combat brigades of the U.S. Army, Marine, regimental combat teams, that's not going to be the answer. What about more airstrikes? There have been calls for to do more from the air, specifically take right. out helicopters that right. uh, the U.S. has said uh, Assad has right. used to drop horrible barrel bombs right. on, on right. Uh, militants. Um, should we have done more from the air at this point? Well, you were doing... And do you see an increase moving forward? I think there's an increase moving forward. I'll give you an example. Uh, there was, uh, I think, a, um, a reluctance until very recently to go after the oil infrastructure that is funding ISIS. And so what we've done is we have, again, concentrated the right types of aircraft. We have now A-10s up in Insulik in Turkey. Uh, they're very good aircraft against this, to these types of targets. And we have other aircraft we brought in. And just a few days ago, we attacked uh, the, the supply trucks, the, the fuel tankers, destroyed about 100 and more than 100 of them. And we, what we did is we sent in, before we hit them, we sent in uh, aircraft to drop leaflets to say, get away, because we're taking these trucks out. Because one aspect of this, and it's, it's both humanitarian, but it's very practical, a military approach, we don't want a lot of collateral damage because ISIS uses that to attack us as killing innocents, and we don't want that. We went in, knocked out those trucks. I think it would be much more aggressive against their delivery mechanisms, the refineries, and that's an example of being much more aggressive with the rules of engagement. Uh, and that, uh, you'll see more and more, I think, air activity. The one thing I think we should uh, 
do is again recognize that we are fighting a very, very uh, clever and well uh, trained because they've been fighting us, some of these folks, for now since the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, for example, some people suggest that we'll just go in and bomb Raqqa, their headquarters in Syria. Well, they've been pulling their people out of Raqqa, and the people that are there are inserted into buildings that are, you know, school buildings or other buildings that would cause not only collateral damage, but give them propaganda victories in terms of our target. So we have to be specific, we have to be uh, precise, uh, but we have to be, to be more aggressive from the air, as well as on the ground. The U.S. policy for a long time has been we have to get rid of President Assad. Right. Now you're starting to hear some more folks saying, I believe Hillary Clinton suggested, yeah. maybe we have to accept Assad stays in place for a while longer as the, you know, the lesser of multiple evils, et cetera. What do you think at this point? Do we have to, and yet Assad is also, I know, driving some of the extremists to, be, what do you do about uh, Assad? Again, the, the complexity of this issue, Assad has used ISIS to his advantage. He is it, one of those claims of legitimacy is I'm the only one fighting these, you know, radicals that are attacking me. And in addition, there is some evidence, uh, complicated and not and murky in some respect, of at least prior relationships with some of the people, the Baathist in Saddam Hussein's government and Baathist in, in Assad's government. But the point is that uh, I think Assad has to go. And the question now is, is there a political mechanism which would have to be arrived at by not just the United States, but the international community, and, and including Russia, to move him out quickly and get in some type of uh, credible sort of non-Assad government, but one that can actually exert governmental authority and have capacity? Because one of the dangers is not just you want Assad out, but you have to ask the question, what comes after? Is it chaos? Mm -hmm. Is it anarchy? Is it everything? Another else? Iraq. Exactly. And so I think we have to do that. Uh, but I don't think we should, uh, given the, Assad's behavior, you can't sort of give him a free pass and say, well, now it's, everything's fine. But, you know, if there is a mechanism that provides a finite duration and that there is clearly a way that he is leaving and that there is another sort of competent but not uh, as insidious character that is going to be used temporarily you know, leading the, the, the government of Syria, that has to be explored. It was complicated this week dramatically by the uh, Turkish uh, shoot down of the Russian aircraft because now the Russians are, you know, Turkey has to be part of that conversation and now their relations are strained, at least. Before we go to the break, uh, I want to have you weigh in on the Syrian refugee crisis. The House mm -hmm. passed a resolution that would in increase the scrutiny and screening right. of Syrian refugees mm -hmm. to the United States. How are you going to vote on that? Well, actually, for the first thing we have to recognize, and I think properly so, is that the protection of the people of the United States is paramount. And then you have to th think very carefully about how do you do that. I'm uh, very skeptical of the, the House proposal because, first of all, the screening of refugees over the last several years has been extremely thorough. Uh, it's a two-year process. Uh, it's all done outside the United States. No one comes here conditionally. They all have to be vetted over two years. It's a multi-agency vetting process, multiple interviews led by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, using FBI databases, using all of the data information that we have available in the United States. The record over the, since 2011, there's been about 20,000 individuals referred to us. There was an initial uh, interview by uh, NGOs that are contracted with the State Department. Finally, we, there, I think about 7,000 folks got to the interviews with the Department of Homeland Security, federal agency, critical to, to doing uh, this screening using FBI databases, using the databases of the Counterterrorism Center of the United States. And of those 7,000 from 2011, 2,000 were admitted, none of whom have been involved in any activity uh, that is uh, threatening to the United States. So we have to go to a break. You oppose the House bills. I just, I just think it, what it will do, frankly, is require, literally, the, the FBI director to certify, which in, means that he would have to review every one of these cases. He would not be, I think, doing it just alone. First of all, it would be very difficult to do anything else if you had to certify to, the, to 12 congressional committees that every one of these things is, is fine. When we have a process in place, 
that the record seems to indicate is not the source of a, a major threat to the United States. We can't assume no threat, obviously. In fact, uh, one of the lead stories today in the New York Times was about the attacks in the United States, no refugees. They were either on a, a, wave, a visa or they were citizens of the United States. Green card. Or they were green cards or they were naturalized citizens. And those are the people that, and by the way, one other point I should make, if we want to do something that's going to help us protect the United States right now, there are individuals on the watch list that can buy firearms in the United States. And the first thing I think we should do is go in and make sure that people who are on the FBI and the intelligence watch list cannot buy a firearm, because frankly, that's the modus operandi of these attacks in Paris, uh, assault weapons in a crowded place. That's what we should be doing. We are way overdue for a break. Our guest this week is U.S. Senator Jack Reed. We'll bring the conversation back to Rhode Island when we come back. There's a bill in Washington that Senator Reed's very concerned about that could gut RIPTA. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi, our guest this week, U.S. Senator Jack Reed. Senator, the House passed transportation bill that has you concerned about its impact on RIPTA here? Well, we uh, put in the legislation several years ago a density formula that uh, recognizes that transit systems in large congested cities like Providence, New York, Boston, et cetera, should have additional uh, fu funding in the formula, and they've essentially taken that out. So we're in conference right now. We have a Senate bill and a House bill, and we are fighting very hard to keep the density formula in. It's about three million dollars for operating expenses at Ripter, which, you know, if they're, if we lose I saw the them, figure 8.5 million. What, it what could that? be that much. I mean, it, it is at least three million. But it's, uh, I don't, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, take the, <laughs> the, the glass the, is half full. No, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> basically I want the, you know, I don't want to. Uh, I'd rather take the, a conservative estimate, but it's at least three million. It could be more. Uh, and if that happens, then the, you know, the impact is reduced service or state expenditures and a tough budget climate for the state. So we're working very hard to, to get the, the formula restored, significant parts of it, so that we can continue to operate a, a bus system, which is so critical to the economy of Rhode Island. People get to work on the buses, particularly lower income people. Seniors use the buses a lot. Well, we need the system. There's a lot of buzz in Providence right now about the possibility GE will move right. its headquarters to Rhode Island. I know the, I've read the Congressional Delegation Connecticut is working on GE to keep it there. Have you had any conversations with GE about this possibility? I hope GE comes, and then after <laughs> GE, Microsoft, and then after Microsoft, uh, every, any, a, a, any international company. No, I must say that, you know, this is an interesting, you know, topic because I'm hearing these things too. And it shows that there's, you know, there's a new sort of uh, uh, vibrancy in the state. And I think the governor's leadership, along with uh, the speaker and the, and the Senate president, they've, they've engendered a lot more enthusiasm for the things they've been doing. And the other factor I think that's helped, too, and it's, you know, the new airport. I mean, we're in the process of extending the runway green. I've worked for years to get federal support for that. And I guess Condé Nast just named it one of the best airports in the nation. So, you know, in order to attract any type of company with an international base, you've got to have good connections. And the airport's one, the train service that we've got to Boston, the, uh, the fact that we've invested in our ports, uh, Quonset Point, Port of Providence, all of that helps the state leaders sort of make the pitch that this is really a good place to do business. Have you talked to anyone at GE? Uh, I, I know some folks at GE, I've, you know, I've, but um, probably about the Red Sox. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Right, um, on the, briefly on the, T, you mentioned TF Green. You actually, uh, I believe you, you've gotten or you're trying to get a study done right. to put, uh, to have Amtrak stock. Right. We have a train station, but it's we only did. MBTA right, right. now. Um, uh, how, I know, I know you're strongly in favor of that, but how feasible is it? And could that happen anytime soon, or would it be many, many years from now? No, I think it could happen not immediately. I mean, it would have to be do the engineering, et cetera. And we've got we're asking Amtrak, uh, asking is a polite way. We're asking Amtrak to to look at the, the feasibility. They're going to have to do a cost benefit analysis. There might be some improvements that have to be made. We'd obviously. If that was the case, try to find a combination of federal and state and private resources to support it. But you know, the MBTA service comes out of the, of the, the all the way down the line to uh, through to Workfit. And, uh, Amtrak service would be very helpful. And the the analogy is uh, BWI. 
That's a, a um, in Baltimore. In Baltimore, exactly. Baltimore International Airport, Thurgood Marshall Airport. They have a quick connection by shuttle to a station which Amtrak stops at, uh, the local MARC train stop at, and it's m a way that most people get to D.C. They fly to, to Baltimore and they'll take those trains in. We could have, I hope, the same combination serving not just Providence but also Boston and other parts. One of the hot topics here in Rhode Island, Senator, has been uh, Governor Gina Raimondo's plan to toll large commercial trucks to pay for right. road and bridge repair. And I, I know this is right now locally a state yeah. issue. Uh, but I'm wondering if the trucking industry has approached your office at all. No, this is a state issue. Uh, uh, this is something that, uh, from all our uh, review, doesn't require uh, any type of sign-off. No, I get that, but I'm wondering if the trucking industry is no, lobbying you. I, I, I ha have Gina Raimondo's ear for sure. They might have, you know, they might have actually, you know, contacted the office, but I haven't heard anything directly. This, I think, this is perceived as it should be. This is the state trying to come up with resources to do what I think the drug industry and everybody else wants to do, fix our roads and bridges. We talked about the transportation bill that we're doing and the transit aspect. The other big aspect of that, of course, is roads and bridges and highway improvements. Our infrastructure is rated D. It's, it's, it's not good. We have to put more money in. And if it's federal dollars, and frankly, we do very well in Rhode Island, roughly anywhere from 2 to $3 more uh, we get than we give in terms of the gasoline tax. We want to keep that ratio. But if the state can provide additional resources, that'll just mean more jobs, more construction, better infrastructure. And it goes back to the point of how do you attract you know, good companies in, into Rhode Island or any place? Well, if there's good, efficient infrastructure, if you're not waiting for hours in, in line in a, in a car commuting, if you can get to an airport and then get overseas, all that helps make us more attractive. So, you know, I, the final resolution of the state, that will be, again, between the governor and the leadership of the General Assembly, the Speaker, and the, and the Senate uh, President, of trying to figure out what's the best way uh, to do that. We, uh, we always have you on. We ask a lot about the headlines. But I'm curious, you've been in the Senate now almost 20 years, since I was, I think, uh, 12 years old when you were first elected <laughs> to the Senate. What, um, Thank you. If you, yeah, <laughs> if you look back over that time period, what do you consider, if any, your biggest mistake over that period? Oh, you know, I've made a lot. And what I'd like to think, no, frankly, uh, to be honest. And I think one thing you want to do is you understand that you do those things, that, but you learn from them. One of the uh, interesting things was in 1991, w when we were considering uh, George Herbert Walker uh, Bush's proposal to conduct operations in Iraq, Desert Storm, I was very leery that, that they would not succumb to the temptation to go all the way into to, uh, Baghdad, to get into the same problems we saw in 2000, you know, later, in 2003, about a decade later. And I thought also we could, we, we, with, we could spend more time with sanctions to pressure, try to pressure, but not give up the option of using military force. And I, looking back, I think I learned a great deal from that. And you voted against that one. I did. I learned a great deal because I saw uh, both President George Herbert Walker Bush his team, Jim Baker, as well as Brent Skokoff, do what you have to do to conduct a successful international operation. First, international support, unlike uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, where we're virtually unilateral. It's just us and the Brits, basically. International support, uh, limited objectives, understanding that our capacity to govern Iraq was very limited, our, our capacity conventionally to expel the Iraqi army from Kuwait was extraordinarily effective. It was a, you know, a military operation of extraordinary dexterity and brilliance. General Scorchkoff and the commanders as well as the president. So, you know, the thing about it is, I don't you say a mistake, I would just chalk it up to experience. That, to me, was very instructive. So when it came around to um, President George W. Bush's proposal, no international support, this whole idea of uh, trying to run a country that's so complex and also, and it's contributed to the dilemmas we face today, sort of breaking the, uh, a country that was a, a Sunni-run country, opening up sort of uh, Shia, Iranian opportunities to expand. I can recall in 2003 going in when we had forces on the ground and visiting King Abdullah in Jordan, and he talked about you know, one of the problems here is we've created what we call the Shia Crescent from Iran, now through Iraq, because it is a Shia-dominated government. It's elected, but it's Shia-dominated. All the way into Syria because of Assad 
is uh, Alawite, and that's a Shia sort of uh, sect, and all the way to Lebanon with Hezbollah. And so suddenly you have this arc of Shia, and the Sunnis, the Saudis, and everyone have been reacting against that, and it's adding to the confusion today. But you know, I think one of the, the, the one of the things you do In about twenty seconds. Yeah. One of the things you do is you, is you 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 do the best. And then you try to learn from everything you do. Some of the things that I, that I would say are just great successes, you know, work share programs, uh, a whole, you learn from them too. You can do a little better. We are taping this on a Wednesday, so I want to say to you, Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Before we do that. And uh, for our viewers, uh, uh, most of you of which are watching after Thanksgiving, we hope you had a happy and safe one. Ted and I will be back next week, so be sure to join us on Newsmakers. We'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.